Philippians chapter 10. We are going to be taking a look at verses uh, 10 through 16. And today we are going to be talking about just simply having a mature viewpoint in life. You know, maturity, that is just simply maturity, generally speaking, in life. Uh, it really is an important thing. I mean, in working in a school district, I can see that uh, the need for maturity, you know, kids need to develop, kids need to mature, kids need to become responsible adults, because if kids don't become responsible adults, then where are the rest of us going to be left uh, when we retire, we're on Social Security. And so, you know, you got to have uh, a certain kind of maturity that's that's there in life. But unfortunately, it seems like generally speaking, and I guess I'm just kind of looking at it from my point of view, um, generally speaking, it seems like maturity is something that's kind of an overlooked type of thing. It seems like the, the focus of society is, no, you don't need to grow up. You don't need to be mature. You don't need to be responsible. You don't need to do that whole adulting thing. You just simply need to do what you want to do and live life is just as long as you can possibly live it. But at the same time, when you've got, you know, not just simply a lot of kids, but a lot of younger people and a lot of older people who have never really stopped to think about the process of maturity and the importance of maturity. When you've got a lot of those people that are out there in society, it seems like the rest of us have a tendency to eventually kind of look around and go, man, I wish people would just simply grow up, right? Okay. Well, one reason why mature immaturity is right there is because maturity isn't really stressed. And I think that the same could be said in Christianity. And that is, it seems like so oftentimes maturity in Christianity isn't stressed very much. And so it seems like Christians have a tendency to stay right there in an immature state, not really thinking and not really understanding of, hey, wait a minute, I need to be broadening my horizons a little bit. I need to be focusing upward, like that song that we sang at the very beginning. You know, we need to be pressing on to the higher ground. And so today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at maturity and we're going to be looking at it from the standpoint of an outlook in life, a viewpoint. We're going to be looking at Paul's viewpoint that he had in life. And as we do, we're going to be seeing, hey, wait a minute, this is the same sort of viewpoint that we need to be having. And as such, we need to be focused on uh, uh, being mature. So our, our text, what we're going to be looking at is Philippians chapter 3 from verse 10 through verse number 16. But let's kind of back the, 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 the truck up just a little bit so we can get a, a running start at those verses. So let's back up to say, oh, let's say verse number 8. Okay. So in verse number 8, it says, what is more? I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness that is of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of the sharing of his sufferings, uh, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view on uh, such things. And if some, um, and if some point you think differently, that too God will make it clear to you. Only let us live up to that which we have already attained. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about is just simply having a, a Christian viewpoint. And I want us to see this in light of uh, looking at the viewpoint that Paul had in his life. Now, when you look at this viewpoint, 
And I know that there's a lot of words here and there's a lot of things to talk about. We'll probably be talking a lot about this in second look later on. But I want us to kind of break this down a little bit as far as taking a look at verses 10 and 11 and seeing a little bit about what Paul generally wanted in life. Now you back up a little bit, and that's why I wanted to kind of get a running start at those verses. And you notice that Paul, what Paul is talking about here is that all the past things in his life, he just simply counted them but lost. And those past things included all of the legalistic things in his life as well, as far as trying to work and attain a relationship with God. And so in his past life, he did try to attain righteousness by the things that he had done, but he came to the point where he realized that, hey, wait a minute, none of those things matter. None of those things work. Instead, what really matters is having a righteousness that comes from God. It's not a righteousness that we are attaining. It is a righteousness that is credited or given to us. And that righteousness is there through faith in Jesus Christ. And so when he came into contact with that grace, when he realized that he was a sinner, he realized that Jesus Christ died for him, and he realized that uh, he could have that relationship by uh, believing in Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden everything just simply changed for him. And all of his perspectives and all of his viewpoints changed from that point going forward. And so what he realized is that he knew Jesus Christ with being saved, but from there, there was a progression. There was a relationship that was there. And what we see that what Paul really wanted in his life from that point forward in verses 10 and 11 was this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of the sharings of his suffering being, uh, being like him in this death and somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, if, if, if you look at this, you might kind of think that Paul was thinking that his future was, was very unclear, you know? He may, may have been, you, you might look at this, and you may look at this, aside from the context of all the other things that he was talking about, and you might say, oh, wait a minute, well, Paul is trying to earn his salvation. He's trying to simply go, and, and he just simply wants to know Jesus Christ as a, a relationship. He wants to know and be a part of the resurrection. He wants to um, uh, suffer with him in this, this life and then eventually attain to the resurrection as far as an earning of, of getting the resurrection. Well, if you look at that, aside from all the other verses, maybe you could see that, but you can't do that. You got to look at that in light of all the other verses. And you notice that, and that's why I want to read verse 9, that's not what Paul was talking about. He was talking about something different. He is talking about simply knowing Christ, but what he wanted to do from that point forward in his salvation was to continue to know Christ, to know Christ more and more, to get to know Christ better, to have more of an experience with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for all, those of us who are saved, I think that we can understand that, right? You know, you look back to your life when you were saved, you probably had a very limited view of Christ. You had very limited um, relationship with Christ. But as you have grown and as you have developed in your salvation, hasn't that grown and developed too? And now you understand a little bit more of who Jesus is. And you understand more about what Jesus expects and you understand more of his love and more of his mercy and more of his compassion. And that's exactly what Paul was saying here. He says, I want to know more and more of this. And not only that, but he, he wanted to know the power of his resurrection. You know, Paul had not yet experienced the resurrection, obviously. Um, no, nobody had, but he's thinking that is out there someday. It's, it's something that he didn't really understand fully. He didn't know about the details, but he knew it was coming. And he just simply wanted to know about that power that was there. And so when you understand a little bit about what Paul's life was about, you understand a little bit about what Paul wanted from life. He is saying, there, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know about the, the sharing of his sufferings. Because if we're going to know Christ, and if we're going to really want to, to have the power of the resurrection, then you know, there's going to be some things that we have to go through right here now that are going to be troubling and going to be suffering. But Paul simply looked forward to that and understood, hey, wait a minute, I've got to go through this bad stuff in order to get to the good stuff later on. 
Now, not only that, but Paul, when we take a look at verse number 12, what we see is where Paul was at versus what he wanted to occur or where Paul was versus what he wanted to occur. So in verse number 12, he goes on to say, not that I've already obtained all this, talking about all that he had just said, nor uh, have I already been made perfect. And so he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm not at the state of perfection. That's going to happen with the resurrection. And so he's not even there yet. But this is what he says. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. And so Paul realized, hey, wait a minute. I'm not all the way there yet, but I know what's going to happen later on. And what's going to happen later on is I want to take hold of the life that's out there and available, ready for me, because Christ is already taken hold of me. You know, when you look at that last part of verse number 12, you see that Paul understood what was going on. He, he, he didn't have an uncertainty about his future. He realized that he was in Christ's hands. And since he was in Christ's hands, there was no better, no safer, no secure place that he could possibly be. Because if he was in Jesus' hands, because Jesus had taken hold of him, you got to understand that uh, Jesus said, you know, that they're in my hands, they're in the hands of the Father, because I and the Father are one. And nobody is stronger than the Father. And so, you know, that is a good place to be. So Paul is saying, I have been taken hold of by Christ. And it's almost like, you know, have you ever seen, um, gone somewhere and seen one of the, the gravity wells with coin? You know, you know like when, when they used to have malls. <laughs> they don't have malls anymore, but they, they used to have the gravity wells. You know, you go and put a coin in there and you see it go and spin, 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 spin. And pretty soon, boop, there it goes, right? It's like gravity takes a hold of that and pulls it down. And so that's kind of the way it is with our salvation. And that is Christ has taken a hold of us and he's got us and he's not going to let go of us. And he's pulling us towards that one thing in the future, which is the resurrection. And Paul's saying, I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more about the power of the resurrection. And so he's saying, I want to take hold of the life because Christ has already taken hold of me. I want to know more about all of these things. And so when you look at this, you can understand a little bit more about what Paul's viewpoint was on his own life. You can see a little bit more about what his ambition was in his own life and how he got to that point. How did he got to that place? Now, when we take a look at our own lives, we have certain viewpoints, don't we? You know, when you look at a, a, a life, you look at our, our lives we have certain perspectives and we have different perspectives in terms of what we deem to be important. And oftentimes we have a whole bunch of different viewpoints because we have a whole bunch of things that are, are important to us. You know, we have family, we have careers, we have houses, we have mortgages, we have a life, we have hobbies, we have interests, we have all kinds of different things that are going on, right? And so when you look at all the different facets in our lives and you see the things that are, are important to us, you kind of see a little bit about a perspective of what is going to drive and motivate us towards a certain thing. I mean, like it or not, money is an important thing, right? You know, now it is not the most important thing and we shouldn't love money because when we love money, then we start to go down a path that's really, really bad. But at the same time, you know, money is an important thing because we have to have money to pay the bills and to eat and so on and so forth, right? And so because that, we sometimes have a certain viewpoint of, okay, well, this is, is since money is important, since a job's important, then this is what I, all I need to do and take care of. And so we've got all these different viewpoints, right? But here's the thing. How often do we put Christ on those viewpoints? Now, as far as Paul goes, we need to understand that our viewpoint is really going to go on and affect what we really go and do in this life. So he goes on to talk about how his viewpoint impacted his Christian life. And I want you to see in verse number 4 to 13, one thing that he did was that he really forgot um, what was in the past. Look at verse number 13. He says, um, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. In other words, he realized he wasn't there to what he really wanted. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. 
I think that that is a very important thing for us to remember in our viewpoint as well is we just have to forget what is behind us, right? Because number one, if, if it has happened in the past, there's not a thing in the words you can do about it, right? When you do something in the past, it's like, you know, you, you've heard the, the, the analogy of a, a, an artist going and carving something in stone. You know, once he hits the, the, the chisel and takes a chip out of the, uh, the statue, it's there, you know, and that's all the way it is. And that's, that's a lot of the way it is with our lives. You know, we do something and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's there. And there is nothing that we can do about it currently i mean yeah yeah maybe we can go and we can make up for it and you know do something like but but as far as an action goes once we do something in the past it's over it's done with now paul is saying that he one thing that he does is he has forgotten what is behind now take a look at at some of the things that paul was talking about as far as forgetting the things that were behind you know you go back into chapter three you start to see that he says that he was in um, verse number um, five. He says that he was um, circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews in regards to the law of Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church as far as legalistic righteousness, faultless. You know, here's all the things in his past. Here's the things as far as his um, legalistic righteousness goes. He, he was a, a, a dedicated man. He was a devout Pharisee. All the things that the Pharisees said, hey, you need to do, he did them. He had a lot of things that he checked off the box. As far as his heritage goes, well, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I mean, he, as far as his heritage, that's the what he had it all down. In regard to his zeal, you notice that he said that his zeal was there persecuting the church. And so you look at Paul and you look at the things that he did in his former life back in the book of Acts when he was uh, known as Saul. He was there going and chasing down Christians often going into foreign cities with letters from the chief priests, chasing down Christians, taking them, taking them cap, uh, captive back to Jerusalem, trying them, and in some cases, putting them to death. If you remember that in the book of Acts, there was one of the deacons of the Jerusalem church, Stephen, who was stoned. And the people that were doing the stoning were laying their cloaks at Paul or Saul's feet because Saul was the one that was organizing and in charge of all of it. And so you think about that, and you think about the things that came up and must have come up in Paul's life, it probably bothered him just a little bit, right? You know, all those things of, man, why did I do that? How did I have that point of view? How could I? So what did he do about it? He forgot about it because it was over and done with. It was in the past. And you say, but wait a minute. He, he, he persecuted Christians. He put innocent people to death. Yes, but that's where the grace and the mercy of Christ trumped the things that he did wrong. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes in our lives, don't we sometimes get bogged down by the things in our past? Maybe we look back in our life and we just, you know, maybe we're just a little bit embarrassed by something or other that we did. Or maybe we have guilty feelings about something that other that we did. Or maybe we look back and we think, what in the world was I thinking when I had that perspective or I had that point of view? What do we do about it? Well, does it do us any good to really dwell on the situation? No. What do we have to do? We have to forget about that. What we need to do instead is we need to look to the future because that's where we're going. Notice what he says in the middle of verse 13 and verse number 14. He says this. <clears throat> he says in verse number 13 that he goes on uh, to say, um, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 
And so the past is past. Instead, what he's doing is he's looking ahead. In fact, he's looking ahead to the point that he is stretching forward. You know, one thing that Paul liked is uh, oftentimes he used analogies of, of sports. And he's using an analogy right here of sport. He's using the analogy of a runner. And so what is a runner doing? A runner is looking forward. He's looking forward to the finish line. He's looking forward to where the race ends. And what he is doing is he extending himself and stretching himself out to get there. You know, if you've got a, a, a runner, especially if he's a sprinter, and if he is starting off his race and he's out of the block, and just as soon as he starts to come up from his stance, he looks and he sees that finish line that's there, and then he turns around and looks to see the starting block. What's going to happen to him? <laughs> he's going to fall behind. You know, in a race, you can't do something like that. You can't be looking back in the past all the time. You've got to be looking forward into the future. You've got to be straining ahead to see what's there. And what Paul was saying in his life, what was there is this, as he says in verse number 14, he pressed on towards the goal to win the prize for which call, God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So here it is out here, right? Here is heaven. Here is the rewards of heaven. Here is everything that God wanted and God was going to reward Paul for doing. And so what his focus was, was that out there. And not only that, but all of those rewards are going to be happening at the time of the resurrection or the time of the rapture. It depends if you're alive when Jesus returns or if you're dead when Jesus returns. And so he's thinking, that point in my life, that's where my focus is. That's where I'm, I'm, I'm reaching for. That's where I'm yearning to be as I'm reaching out there for that because I want that. You remember what I said earlier is that he said, I want to know Jesus. I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to have the, the sharings of the sufferings. Why would Paul want to have the sharings of the sufferings? Because he knew that whatever he went through in this current age, then he would be rewarded for later on. You see, here we've got this viewpoint and see how if you have that viewpoint, it's going to affect the way that you run your life right here and now. Now, as far as, as us, you know, what are we focusing our lives on? And again, we have all kinds of different viewpoints because we have all kinds of different things going on, right? But the one viewpoint that we really need to have more than anything else is the one viewpoint that has got to be the most important one. The one that is going to not only just simply affect our lives here and now, but really our lives here and now affecting what our eternity is going to be and that is just simply knowing jesus knowing the power of his resurrection being and being a sharer of his sufferings as we work and we serve and as we go towards jesus christ but is that what we're focusing on so many times in our lives as we are going through our lives it is so easy to focus on all the other things right okay it's easy to focus on the career it's easy to focus on family. It's easy to focus on the friends and doing things. It's easy to focus on the hobbies. It's easy to focus on all these other things. And then all of a sudden we got caught up and we go, oh yeah, I should have remembered about Christ. So many times when we get to the point where we realize, hey, I need to be focusing more on Christ, then our mind starts to pull back and Satan starts to bring us back to all the things that have happened in the past. Well, if, if I only would have done that, then maybe this would have been better. If only, if, why did I have to do that? You know, then this, well, what about, but you can't do it because you can't do anything. Instead, what we need to do is take from Paul's perspective and just simply say, you know, what's in the past is past. It doesn't matter. Don't care about it. Don't look at it. Don't worry about it. Because it's behind you. You can't do anything about it. Instead, look forward. 
Look forward to Jesus coming again. Look forward to the resurrection. Look forward to all the glory and everything that is going to be there. Now, no, we don't understand all that, but neither did Paul, but that doesn't matter, right? Because we know that by the power of God, we know by the grace and the mercy of God that because we have accepted Jesus, because we have that righteousness that comes through faith, it's readily available for us one of these days. But we're not there yet. We just look for it and we keep pursuing that. And as we keep pursuing it, maybe we're going to have times that we experience trials and we experience tribulations. Maybe there's going to be some people out there that don't understand our point of view. Maybe there's going to be some people out there that are going to be opposed to us. But that's okay. Because people were opposed to Christ. And they didn't understand His point of view either. But we want to know Christ. We want to know Him more. We want to know Him better. We want to know what things are going to be awaiting for us at that finish line. And so what we do is we keep pressing forward. Keep stretching out. Don't look behind. Don't look to either side. But run as a race and set our sights right there and keep on going. Right? Now, you say, okay, that's great. But what does this have to do with maturity? It actually has everything to do with maturity. Because when you take a look at verses 15 uh, and 16, you see it. Notice in verse number 15, he says this. All of us who are mature should take such a view on things. And so if you want to be mature, then you are going to have the same sort of approach that Paul had. You know, this was the approach that he had in his life. This is what he was doing in his life. And Paul was a mature Christian. And so if you want to be a mature Christian, then you better have the same sort of approach that Paul had. Okay. You say, well, I don't know if I want to have that same approach. Then you're not going to be a mature Christian. You know, that's all that there is to it, okay? Because that's exactly what the Holy Spirit inspired him to say here in verse 15. All of us who are mature should take such view on things. Now, here's what's interesting is this word that is translated in verse 15, that is mature, okay? The word that is translated in verse 15 as mature is the same word that we say in verse 12 as has already been made perfect, okay? Now, it's a different form of the word, and so it takes on a little bit different meaning. But at the same time, when you understand what this is talking about, you understand, oh, now I get it, how these two things relate, okay? Now, this word mature in this word that has already been made perfect is really been, uh, talking about just simply to complete, or to bring to an end, to take to an end. And so, therefore, that's how you get the idea about perfect, right? You know, when you take a process to its end, uh, when you complete the process, then hopefully, if the process is right and everything, then you're going to wind up with the perfect product. If you don't work, wind up with the perfect product, then all of a sudden, you, you, you didn't do something right in the, in, the, in the process, right? You know, but if everything goes according to plan, if everything's good, then you got something perfect when you wind up. Now, here's the thing. In our Christian lives, we are not going to be made fully perfect until when? Until the resurrection, right? When the resurrection happens and our perfect minds and our perfect spirits are going to be uh, united with a perfect body that happens when that body is glorified and brought back to life, when all that happens, that is going to be that perfection that is there. And so if you think about the direction that our salvation is taken, the, the direction our salvation is taken is right to that point of what the resurrection is going to be. And so there it is, okay? And so Paul is saying, I'm not there, okay? I'm not there at the resurrection. I'm not perfect. And Paul was by no means perfect in this life. But you can see that maturity plays a role in it, doesn't it? And that is that when Paul was saying, hey, when I live my life to this end over here, then I'm going to be maturing as I go. In other words, I am going to be perfecting, but understand, you're not going to be perfect, okay? But I'm going to be maturing, I'm going to be 
I'm bringing things to a conclusion. I'm going to be getting better about things. And so there's the idea about maturing that's there. So when you start to take that attitude of, I want to know Jesus, I want to know the power of the resurrection, I'm straining forward to that point, then you can start to see that maturity is happening. And that maturity is there because you're thinking, hey, I want to serve God here now. Okay? But many times, if you're like me, you think, wow, okay, that is quite a concept, but I just don't know how much I'm there yet, right? Well, understand that maturity is not something that we reach and that's it. It's not like Paul was coming up here and hitting maturity and then he was leveling out. It's that maturity is really just simply a process that's in place. Look at verse number 16. He just simply says this. He says, only live up to what we have already attained. In other words, are, is your life at a point in what God wants you to be? Because until we reach that point where we are perfect, all of us are going to be sinners, right? Okay. There's always going to be an imperfection. You say, well, wait a minute. When I die and, you know, my, my mind and my spirit go to be with the Lord in heaven, they're going to be perfect, right? Well, yeah, they're going to be perfect. They're going to be sinless. But at the same time, you're still not going to be at that point where God wants you to be until that resurrection happens. Okay. And even back beyond that, you know, we're still going to live in this life of sin. But God wants us to be at a certain point, a certain time, you know. Where we were, when we were first saved, God may say, hey, you know what, Stephen Lee, that's okay for you right there. Then later on, he wants more from me. And later on, he wants more from me. And later on, he wants more from me, right? So what Paul is saying is, you need to be at the point that you have already attained, okay? You need to be at what God wants you to be. When all of a sudden you start to live underneath that, then all of a sudden that's where God starts to get involved. Now going back to verse, uh, middle of verse 15, notice he says this. He says that if you're mature, you should take such a view on things. And if some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. And the question that comes to my mind is how is God going to make it clear to us? You know, sometimes he's going to make it clear to us through conviction. You know, we, we, we start to think about what we should be and where we are. And we start to say, you know what? It, it just doesn't meet up. It, it, I, I, it, I, I'm not there. I, I need to be doing better. Right. And when we start to think that way, then we start to go to the Lord and say, Lord, with your grace and your mercy, help me to do better. OK. And then all of a sudden our start focus starts to become back in line with things. But at the same time, sometimes we think, well, I'm not there and I don't want to be there. <laughs> I know where God wants me to be and I know where I'm at right now and I don't want to be there. I want to be here. I want to be stuck back here in backslidden land. Well, what does God do to us then to make us realize you don't need to be back in backslidden land? Well, he disciplines us. We think that discipline sometimes is God being upset and punishing us, but discipline is not God being upset and punishing us. It may be that he's upset with us, but the thing is that he's not punishing us. He's trying to get us to go from where we are to where we need to be. Okay? And so here we are in our lives, right? And I'm talking about having this mature viewpoint on things having a, an outlook in our life that would reflect a level of maturity in our Christian lives. Well, we need to understand that where is it that we need to look? Where is it that our focus needs to be? What direction do we need to take? It's got to be upward and onward. It can't be behind us. It can't be all over the place. It needs to be looking at a certain point when Jesus comes. And when we look at that point, then God is able to lead us and guide us and direct us. And when that happens, then we are starting to be on the track of maturity. And so the real question is, is what is our life viewpoint, right? I mean, we've got a lot of different viewpoints in life. And like I said, it's just that we've got a lot of things that's going on. We have a lot of irons in the fire and 
We're no different. That's the way that it's always been. But one thing that we need to understand as far as from a Christian's perspective, we need to have this same sort of focus. We need to have this same sort of viewpoint that Paul was talking about. We need to look forward to the future and forward to when Jesus Christ comes back again. And when we start to look forward to that future when Jesus Christ comes back, then we can start to say, but how do I serve Christ now? How and what is God doing with my life right here now? When we start to look at it that way, then we can start focusing and we can start dealing with maturity. Now, before I leave off on this, I want to go back and just briefly look at verse number 9 again. And in verse number 9, you notice that he says, And be found in him not having any righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Today, if you're in this room or if you're watching us on YouTube, if you're thinking, wait a minute, how am I going to stand before a righteous God? What good do I have in my life that is going to, you know, kind of get me in heaven? Well, you can be a good person all you want and still not get into heaven because getting into heaven is never and was never about doing good things and doing enough good things to get there. Getting to heaven is always about being forgiven of the bad that keeps you out. Think about that for a second. And that is, here Jesus Christ, God has created humanity to be with Him. It's because of sin we have fallen away from Him. But God still wants us there. And so, if we can't possibly work our way back up to God and God wants us there, you know what He does? He sends us a Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we realize that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ through faith in Him, then it's not a matter of doing good things to get to God. It's a matter of God giving us what we need in order to bring us to Him. You know, that's what being saved is all about. <laughs> it's, it's about God saving us. It's about God rescuing us. And so, you know, just asking you a question this morning. You know, where is your source of righteousness? If your source of righteousness is the things that you do, whether they're good deeds or whether they're religious deeds or whether they are from your, your past or your heritage or whatever it is, you know, if you're thinking, I'm going to stand before God because, you know, I, I, I'm like looking at Paul, you know, I'm son of a Pharisee. I'm, I'm, you know, legalistically perfect. I'm zealous for doing what he wants. I'm, you know, I've got all these good things going for me. If that's the case, then you're going to fall short because you haven't come to the point where you realize that in spite of all your good things, they may be good, you still have sin that's there. And the sin that's there can only be made up for with the need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. So today, if you realize that, I hope that you'll believe in Him and I hope that you'll ask Him to forgive you. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this day and everything that's there. We thank you for the life that you give us. And we thank you for most especially for the life that has come. Lord, help us to focus on it. Help us to live our lives in light of what uh, you are, are going to do for us. And Lord, we ask that you'd help us to and give us the grace and the mercy so that we can attain to the standard that you want us to. Lord, we ask that you be at the lost, wherever they may be. Help them to know you and help them to understand what you've done for them. Lord, please forgive us of our sins. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.